Hollywood Radio Theater. We get many enjoyable moments out of the books we read, the sights we see, and above all, the things we hear. The Hollywood Radio Theater hopes to add to your enjoyment by bringing you each week the finest in dramatic and comedy entertainment featuring a stellar cast of movie personalities, many of whom will appear in their original motion picture roles. Now, here is our producer, Mr. William Peel. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. From whistle stops to Union Station, there is a tremendous interest in the arrival and departure of trains and their passengers. And in tonight's play, Union Station, we will tell you a story of the absorbing drama that goes on behind the scenes in a railway station. The thrilling hunt for a kidnapper and his victim as the police form a dragnet throughout the network of the vast terminal. As our stars of this entertaining Paramount picture, we have three of the original stars, who are also three of your favorites. The romantic team of William Holden and Nancy Olson, and that arch villain, Lyle Betker. Now, Union Station, starring William Holden as Lieutenant Detective Calhoun, Nancy Olson as Joyce Willicum, and Lyle Betker as Beacom. <laughs> to most people, a railroad station is a place where you get on or off a train. But when you've got 80,000 people doing that every day of the year, there are times when the public wants the law around. Now, that's where I come in. My name's Calhoun, Lieutenant Detective, and my precinct is Union Station. We operate 24 hours a day. Men in uniform, men in plain clothes. Sometimes we're the man who wears a red cap and carries your baggage. Sometimes we sell you a ticket or hand you a timetable at the information booth. But all the time, there isn't an inch of the Union Station that isn't under observation. Often we get involved in something that begins miles away from the Union Station. But if it happens on railroad property, wherever that might be, sooner or later we're in on it. And what you're about to hear is a pretty fair example of what I mean. All of this began at one of the smaller stations way out in the suburbs. It was in the middle of the afternoon. Local 42 was doing about 10 minutes. A car drew up to the station. In it, a chauffeur and two girls. Thanks for the ride, Charlie. Not at all, miss. Well, Lorna, I'll see you in a couple of days. Oh, don't go, Joyce. We can wait until your train gets here. Oh, no, you're late enough already. We should have dropped you off to the doctor's first. Oh, there's no hurry. I can tell you exactly what the doctor will say. He'll tinker with a dozen instruments. Then he'll say, turn your head up, Miss Murchison. Now to the right. Now the left, please. I don't want to raise any false hopes, Miss Murchison, but... Well, anyway, one of these days that butt is going to work for me. You bet it is. Maybe this will be the day. Take care of her, Charlie. Don't you worry, miss. I will. I'll phone you tomorrow, Lorna. Oh, oh, I almost forgot. Here's your scarf. Thanks for lending it to me. Number 42 was on time that day. It took eight or ten passengers aboard and left the station less than a minute later. The conductor picked up the tickets and was standing on the platform between the cars. Yes, miss? There's a man inside carrying a gun. Well, maybe he's got a right to carry it. A lot of people have. Shh, I know, I know. But he and the other man were just racing the train in a car. Who else saw the gun? I don't know, but I certainly did. Oh, people are always seeing things on trains. I've got to check these tickets. Aren't you going to do anything about it? They might have done something. Maybe a holdup. They got out of an automobile, but now they're sitting apart like strangers. I have 22 years in this job, lady. And I didn't keep it by minding my passenger's business. As long as... I'd I... rather not hear any more lecturing. If you don't intend to do anything about it, I will. All right, I'll do what the regulations say I should. I'll wire ahead and have a cop waiting for you at Union Station. I'll get you the head man himself. Thank you. Lieutenant Calhoun, you can tell Willie Calhoun all about it. Something coming in for Calhoun. Conductor on Local 42. Passenger insists armed criminals are aboard. Demands you meet train and investigate. You better find Calhoun. Yeah. I guess nothing's ever done right around here unless tough Willie does it himself. <laughs> How long have you been working here, Adam? Uh, oh. Oh, hello, Lieutenant. How long? Uh, six weeks, sir. Well, you need 25 years before you're eligible for pension. And you won't make it. Not if you ever call me Willie. Yes, sir. About this teletype, sir. You busy, Shadow? You... No, sir. 42's due on track 12. 
Meet me down there in 15 minutes. Right. We arranged to get the passenger off the train before anyone else. She wasn't nervous, just annoyed. I don't know what the conductor told you, Lieutenant. I'm sure he thinks I'm crazy. Just keep your voice down, miss, and follow me. I will stand behind the ramp. We can see the other passengers as they walk out, but they can't see us. Now, just tell me what it's all about. I suppose you think I'm a fool, too. I'm interested only in one thing, armed criminals. Well, I got on the train at West Hampton. I've been out at my employer's home. Just as the train left, I happened to look out of the window and I... There they are. The man with the suitcase has the gun. Shut up. Tell him. Yeah, only watch yourself. This may be nothing at all. The railroad doesn't want any lawsuits. All right, miss. What's your name and address? I don't quite see why that's necessary. Well, I do. When anyone asks me to stick my neck out, I want to know who's doing the asking. Just because I was foolish enough to report something, as, as any decent citizen would, is no reason for me to get involved. That's all I am, too. A citizen. Only it's my business to protect the railroad, to see that they don't get stuck with lawsuits by taking information from people who refuse to give their names and addresses. My name's Joyce Willicombe, 614 Carson. This is ridiculous. Any business address? 84 State Street, Henry L. Murchison Corporation. That the fellow whose house you were visiting? I'm Mr. Murchison's secretary. Okay, okay. Let's go to my office. This way, miss. Then I told the conductor on the train that... Uh, excuse me. Hello? Shattuck, Lieutenant. Well? I lost them. Sorry. Oh, fine. But I got something you may want. Two men walked over to the parcel locker's north section and checked that suitcase. Locker number P-372. 72, right. Then they put the key in an envelope and dropped it in a mailbox. They went out to the street and I, well, I lost them. Okay, Shattuck, get back up here. Stein? Yeah? Locker number P-372, north section. Bring up whatever you find. Well, miss, maybe we'll learn something. You mind waiting? I'll wait. They put the suitcase in one of those parcel lockers. That's probably where your friend ditched his gun. Meanwhile, just tell me what happened on the train. You spoke to the conductor and... Here's the suitcase, Lieutenant. At least it isn't locked. Open it up. Ah, yeah, it's practically empty. Just a few clothes. A pair of gloves, a scarf... One of those berets and... and no gun. Looks like we made a mistake. Just a minute. That scarf. That's Lorna's. Lorna Murchison's. She came to the station with me. Their chauffeur drove us. She had loaned me this scarf. These are her things. Lorna Murchison? Boss's wife? His daughter. She was on her way to the doctor's and she dropped me off at the station. How old a girl? Eighteen. Don't you see? Something's happened to her. Why the doctor's? She went to the doctor regularly. Lorna Murchison is blind. Blind? You mean this blind girl, this Lorna Murchison, might have been kidnapped? They must have had her in that car, the car I told you about. The one that raced after the train. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Lorna Murchison and the chauffeur drove you to the station. You got on the train. A few minutes later, you saw an automobile racing down the road Yes, and... yes, I've told you. The train was going slowly. The car caught up, two men got out and jumped on. Who else was in the car? I don't know. When they got on the train, they acted like strangers. Why, they didn't even sit together. Aren't you going to do anything? Stein, call the city police, Inspector Donnelly. All right, Miss Willicom. Where can I reach Murchison? What's his phone number? Murchison wasn't home. He was at the police station in West Hampton, reporting the kidnapping of his daughter. A couple of their men drove him into town. All right, all right. Now, we're not getting anywhere making guesses. Now, once again, Mr. Murchison, you were certain your chauffeur's in the clear. I've told you a dozen times, Lieutenant. He's been with us for 20 years. It's a miracle he's even alive the way they beat him. Okay. And neither you nor the city police have any right to interfere. My daughter's life may be at stake. Well, Donnelly? I can speak for the city police, Mr. Murchison, and I may as well be honest. You'll be dealing with kidnappers, with lice. They never keep their word to anyone about anything. They won't to you. I'll do whatever they tell me to do. I'll pay them any amount of money they want. If they give you that chance, sure. All I ask is don't protect them. Promise anything, anything that'll get your daughter back. But cooperate with us. I, I want you to stay out of this until I find Lona. Mr. Murchison, uh, the key to that locker was put in an envelope and mailed. Now, there's no doubt but what it's addressed to you. Now, with that key, they'll send instructions. But they won't make a move until you've received it. That won't be till tomorrow. So, meanwhile, we're going to put the suitcase back in the locker, and we want your permission to keep it under observation, just in case one of them should return. No, not until Lorna's found. Oh, we'll do it quietly. I've got good, efficient workers here at the station. City police are here. I'm 
Sure that we can guarantee you? My that... daughter? You'll guarantee my daughter will be returned to me safe, alive? Oh, no, sir. I'm afraid there's no one who can guarantee that. Well, let us handle these people, Mr. Murchison. We've worked together before. We've, we've spent our lives at it. We'll use what we know before they're ready for us. We've got till the morning anyway. No. Well, we don't want to push you into anything. After all, she's your daughter. You're the only one who has the right to decide. What do you want me to do? Well, we'll need a full description of what Lorna wore today and whatever pictures you have. Joyce, Miss Wilcom here, can tell you what she wore. Yes, of course. As for pictures, I told you when you telephoned. There haven't been any pictures, not since Lorna lost her sight five years ago. But you can take these if they'll do you any good. Thank you. I'd like to go home now. Maybe they'll telephone instead of waiting till tomorrow. I'll go with you, Mr. Murchison. Uh, Miss Willigan might be able to help us here if she'd stay. How, Lieutenant? Well, if someone should come to the locker, there's a chance you could make an identification. He's right, Joyce. Now, if they should phone, you'll let us know? I want my daughter, Lieutenant. I can't promise anything. We took the girl down to police headquarters, Rogues Gallery. We got nowhere. Then we left Inspector Donnelly to start the long, slow process of checking everyone who'd been in recent contact with the Murchison household and went back to Union Station. There's one thing Number about 19, working for a railroad station, miss. Three. You're always near a lunch counter for a cup of coffee. What time is it, Mr. Shattuck? 3 a.m., almost. Now, don't worry about the locker. We got men watching. And you think kidnappers would come here with men on guard? Not if they could see them. We've got places to watch them from, Miss Willikin. Telephone booths, grill work, ticket windows, dozens of places. Well, it looks like it's going to be a long night. Maybe she could go home for a few hours. Let's play it safe, Shattuck. You don't mind staying, do you? No, I, I couldn't sleep anyway. Look, I'm going to wander around for a while. If you see anyone, don't wait to make sure. Just tell Shattuck. Now, that's important. This is the fourth time you've told me. I still say that if they show it all, Lieutenant, it won't be until Murchison comes back to open the locker. Never mind the ifs. If she'd noticed anything about the car, the license number, anything, we'd have something to bite into by now. I know it's all my fault, Mr. Shattuck. You see, I had those two men right under my nose. But I didn't follow them. I was too busy giving my name and address to someone. <laughs> Shattuck was right. Nothing happened until almost noon of the next day when the mailman dropped the letter off at the Murchison house. In it was the key to the locker and a note. He came straight to Union Station, and then we got the break we'd been waiting for. Murchison was being followed. That's the man. He was with the other one yesterday on the train, the one who had the gun. Just stay where you are, Miss Willikin. What's he going to do? Nothing. He's just making sure that Murchison is alone that the police aren't with him, and that Murchison opens the locker. And you're just going to sit here? Why don't you arrest him? Because he can lead us to Lorna Murchison. So we're going to follow him. He's leaving. He's walking out. That's right, Miss Willikin. So am I. The man walked for a couple of blocks to the subway station. He took a downtown local. Eight of us followed but only one stayed close to him. At each subway stop, one of us would leave and another take over. I don't know what we did wrong, but somehow he became suspicious. At the Fullerton Street station, he stepped out onto the platform as if he were leaving. Shattuck was right behind him, and then the man quickly went back into the car. There was nothing Shattuck could do but follow him. The man knew for sure now. Once again, he ran out of the car and up the stairs. Stairs, Calhoun! Be careful! He's got a gun! We're right behind you, Shattuck, but don't shoot. We need him alive. He was running toward the stockyards. As we closed in, he jumped a fence and headed for the cattle pens. He was giving us a bad time, but he didn't stand a chance of getting away. And then he stopped and began firing at us. That was his big mistake. The sound of the shot stampeded the cattle. And by the time they were driven off, our suspect had been trampled to death. Oh, uh, Inspector Donnelly suggested it. You should have been home long ago. It's too bad you lost that man. Yeah. I've been waiting for you to say that. But at least we know who he was. His name was Gus Hatter. Where he lived, fingerprints, driver's license. Donnelly's got men planted at the hotel and on his telephone. If anyone tries to get through, they'll take him. I suppose that's the best way to look at it now. Try not to think about the other kidnappers. The ones who are waiting for that man to get back. 
I wish I hadn't said anything about those men on the train. We should have stayed out of it, all of us. That's what Mr. Murchison wanted. Look, men like Donnelly have had years and yes, years of experience. Yes, I know. Leave kidnappers to men who know how to handle them. Make sure the railroad company isn't sued. Why doesn't someone think about Lorna Murchison? She's all that counts. I don't care how many kidnappers you catch, whether they're caught or not. I care about her. We all do, Miss Willicum. What instructions did Mr. Murchison get in that letter? Well, he's to be standing in front of the information booth tonight at 8 o'clock. They'll contact him there. They're going to use your station again? Yes, they're going to use my station. Uh, Donnelly thinks you'd better be there, too. Where? My office at 7.30. Very well. Thanks for the ride, Lieutenant. <laughs> Eight o'clock, the kidnappers had said. That gave us time, Donnelly and me, to get our plans fairly well organized. They have it all figured out, Calhoun. They know the station's going to be jammed with weekend crowds, worse than yesterday. Well, the more people, the better. We can scatter an army down there, and nobody will ever notice them. Whoever engineered this kidnapping, uh, that kind of a man won't come himself. No. He'll send someone else. Like, uh, well, like the fellow who drove the car. Nobody's seen him. My guess is that he's probably the one taking care of the girl. Well, what makes you think anybody's taking care of her? I wouldn't be lifting a finger, not a finger. If I could make myself believe that Lorna Murchison's still alive... Now, how can... I don't believe it. Not ten minutes after they took her. Well, how do we lay it out? I want your men to cover every exit and every entrance. Now, we've got a dozen phones planted around the station. I'll have a man at every one. Stein will be with the station announcer. We've got signals he can give over the public address system. We have four clerks in the information booth. Tonight, two of those clerks will be Shattuck and me. I think we'd better have another talk with Murchison. He's staying in town, and I just want him to be sure that we're... We were ready and waiting at 8 o'clock. Murchison stood at the information booth. And nearby, sitting under the clock, Joyce Willicum pretended to be reading the evening papers. For 20 minutes, nothing happened. And then... Telegram for Mr. Henry Murchison. Telegram for Mr. Henry Murchison. Mr. Murchison, please. Here, boy. They were playing it smart. A telegram instead of a contact. Murchison read the message and started walking away. But he remembered what to do. He crumbled the message and dropped it on the floor. A moment later, it was swept up by a porter. Information booth? Donnelly, the porter just brought in the telegram. They want Murchison in the main concourse at a phone booth between the drink and fountain and the newsstand. They put an out-of-order sign on the booth, but a phone call will come in at 8.30. We've got three minutes. I'll give Stein the flash. Right. This is Stein. They've made contact. Get on the PA. Track 14 signal. Yes, sir. Attention, please. Mr. F.E. Nelson is wanted at track 14. Mr. F.E. Nelson... Please go to track 14. We started closing in from every corner of the station, casually, inconspicuously. Murchison stood by the phone booth waiting for the call. Meanwhile, Joyce Willicum was still under the clock, and then suddenly she noticed someone walking across the station. Clerk, where did he go? Lieutenant Calhoun. Well, I couldn't tell you, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm Miss Willicum. I'm... Yeah, I'm... I know who you are, miss. Then tell him I've just seen the man with the gun. He's walking out of the station, and I'm going to follow him. Act two of Union Station will continue shortly. You've all heard the old nursery rhyme, For want of a nail, a shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, a horse was lost. For want of a... And it goes on and on until the kingdom was lost. Such a small thing as a horseshoe nail was responsible for the losing of a kingdom. The moral of that nursery rhyme is that it's the small things that count. And these words most certainly do apply to you servicemen and women overseas, especially in your relations with people in a foreign country. You see, our foreign policy is based on our desire to promote a better understanding among the peoples of all nations. Our military policy is based on our desire to promote world peace. So if you're an American serviceman or woman overseas, you're there to support both of these policies. On duty or off duty, in dealing with people in a foreign country, you can't afford to neglect the small things. America is striving for mutual understanding and trust. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think about your country depends on you. Now our producer, Mr. William Keeley. 
Act two of Union Station, starring William Holden as Bill Calhoun, Nancy Olson as Joyce, and Lyle Betker as Beacom. <laughs> The man with the gun had come to the station. He had paused long enough to make sure Murchison had gone to the phone booth. Then he left and went around the block to a parked car. And following him was Joyce Willicombe. He was talking to someone. All right, Marley, get over to the station. Murchison's waiting for the phone call. I want to be sure the cops aren't in on it. Hey, Joe, look, maybe it's smart if I don't go in there smelling around, huh? What's the matter, Marley? You had the shakes ever since this started. Oh, uh, what about Gus? I want to know what happened to Gus. You and Gus. The shake and shiver boys. He ran out, now you want the same. Okay, you're out. Marge and I'll handle this alone. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't say I wanted to quit. I can talk the angles with you, can I? Always yammering about details. I set the details. I sat in a cell for five years setting details. This time, nothing and nobody stops me. Make up your mind. All right, all right. I'll go on the station. All right. I'll give you time to get there, then I make the phone call. All right, I'll see you back at the place in an hour. Get going, Molly. Joyce followed Molly back to the station. Murchison was still waiting for the phone call. Lieutenant. Get back under the clock. You were told to stay there. I know I was. But just in case you're interested, one of the kidnappers just walked in. Where is he? He's sitting down, facing the first phone booth. The call's coming through. Look, find Donnelly. Tell him what you just told me. Tell him we won't do a thing until Murchison's through talking. And hurry, please. Murchison left the booth. If he'd do what we ask him to do, he'd go straight for my office now and tell Donnelly what he'd heard on the phone. But I couldn't wait to find out. The man facing the first phone booth had started to leave. Shattuck, Faye, and I closed in on him. Got a message for you, Jack. Sorry, you made a mistake. It's from Gus. Gus Hatter. Not me. I don't even know who you're, you're coming talking. with us downstairs. Where's Lorna Murchison? Lorna, who? Who are you talking about? I may have to beat your brains out. I'll let you decide. But we're gonna find out where she is. I may as well tell you, Mr. Murchison. There's no way for us to trace that telephone call. Now, um, what did he tell you? I'm to come back tomorrow at noon. The information booth. With $100,000. A package? He wants it in the suitcase, the one you people found in the locker. He's going to send for it, but the messenger won't know anything. He'll be watched, and if anyone talks to him or, or tries to follow him, he said, I, I'll never see Lorna again. Well, just go ahead with the arrangements, Mr. Murchison. Uh, can you get the money okay? Yes. I, I know what you're all thinking, Inspector, but maybe Lorna is alive. He said she is. Please... Please don't do anything to interfere. Murchison was gone when I got back to the office. But it was Joyce Willicombe that I wanted to talk to. I told Inspector Donnelly everything I know. I saw the man with the gun come into the station. When he left, I followed him. He went over to State Street and, State Street and spoke to a man in a car, the one, the one who came back here. Oh, what about him, Calhoun? Did you get anything out of him? Not yet, but I will. Now, look, this man you saw... No question about it, huh? The same one you saw on the train? Yes. I'm almost afraid to ask you this. The car, did you think to look at the license number? I didn't trust my memory. I wrote it down. Well? Mr. Murchison asked you not to do We've anything... We've got to have that license number, Miss Willicom. Very well. 49R280. I'll send a B-alarm. No teletype or radio. Let every precinct captain give it to his men. When we're through with that customer down in the basement, we'll know a little more. I'll join you there in five minutes. <laughs> took a little doing, but in time, Marley was ready to talk. He had plenty to tell us. No, 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 wait, wait. Well, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. The girl's all right. She hasn't been hurt. You're lying. You killed Lorna two days ago. No, 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 honest. They, they got her in a roaming house on the south side, 2115 Mulberry Street. Second floor in the back. Who's got her? I want names. Beacom. Joe Beacom and his girl. Joe Beacom? He got a record? Yeah, yeah. Stein, get some pictures on him. Now, what made you pick the station for the payoff? Joe Pickett. Used to work here around the freight yard. You're going to take us to Mulberry Street, Marley. You're going to take us right to Joe Beacom now. It was a fair bet that Marley was telling the truth, that Lorna Murchison was alive. 
It took us a few minutes to set up the raid. And then we started out for the south side. A rooming house on Mulberry Street. Second floor in the back. Now, look, Lorna, don't be a dope. Just stay put and shut up. He's coming back. I can hear his feet on the stairs. I can tell by his footsteps. You let Joe find out you can identify <laughs> anything about him and that'll be all for you. You got a chance to live because you can't see, because you're blind. Can't you understand that? Oh, stop it, will you? You'll go home just as soon as we collect from your father. You'll pay the money, will he, honey? You'll pay it. You'll pay. Right on schedule. I hope he doesn't. Get rid of me now. I don't care. Marge, put that towel around her mouth and keep it there. You're going to kill me anyway. Do it now. I don't care. Give me that towel. Go ahead. Kill me. Get rid of me. I stopped off at the store. Here. Pick some sandwiches. Where's Marley? How do I know? Well, he ought to be here by now. He said in an hour. This time tomorrow, Joe. A hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Any coffee? It's perking. You know what, honey? It'd stack up two stories high in one dollar bills. I just figured it out. I'm worried about that Marley. He didn't want to go into the station. I bet you ten to one he ran out. Just like Gus. It looks like you're the only one I can depend on, baby. You always could. You're going to send that kid home, aren't you, Joe? I mean, after you collect. Yeah, she'll go home. If they ever fish her out of the river. Let's have some of that coffee, huh? Joe, no. No, you can't do that. I said I want some coffee. We threw 20 men around the rooming house. Then four of us went in through the cellar and started up the stairs. Now? Go ahead, Marley. Knock on the door. Right. Joe! Joe, it's, it's me, Molly. Joe? You've got a key. Use it. All right, let's go. The place was empty. We got there too late. Sure, sure, they're gone. They got scared waiting for me to show up and they blew. Yeah, you see that chair? That's where he tied up the girl. I wasn't lying, mister. The girl's alive, I tell you. Coffee pot the kitchen, Inspector. It's still warm. Well, you've got to call off that alarm, Donnelly. Forget about his car. Why, well, it's the best lead we've got left. We can't gamble anymore. Beacom's not the kind to go down alone. Once he knows we're on to him, the girl won't stand a prayer. Let him pick up the money tomorrow. We'll try for him later. I just thought I'd drop by and tell you, uh, we missed them. They were gone by the time we got there, but, uh, Lorna Murchison's all right. I, I mean, she's alive. She's alive? Yeah. And Donnelly called off the alarm on the car, and we won't interfere with the payment tomorrow. Well, I just thought you'd like to know. Joyce, who are you talking to? Come in, won't you? Oh, thanks. Uh, this is my mother. Mother, this is Lieutenant Calhoun. Oh, yes, the policeman. You said Lorna's alive. Oh, I'm sure you'll get her safely back. You will, won't you? Oh, I hope so. Uh, won't you sit down, Mr... Uh, Bill, Mrs. Willicombe. Why, my husband's name was Willie, too. Uh, Joyce tells me you're with the railroad station. <clears throat> uh, yes, ma'am. Oh, it must be very interesting, Willie. Oh, I'm probably like everyone else, in and out of the station a hundred times and never really looking at it. It's awfully big and crowded, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah, yes, it is. It, uh, it covers over six acres. Uh -huh. Counting the daily commuters, we handle about 80,000 people a day. And that doesn't include the people who are just wandering through it, you know, using the station as a shortcut. Uh, go right on, Willie, but you'll excuse me, won't you? I have the water boiling for tea. Um, you're still sore. They know, don't they? The kidnappers. They know now that the police are after them. Look, there wasn't any choice. Not for me, not for anyone. There was a good chance we could catch up with them. We took that chance. You have a different viewpoint. But a, a cop can't be sentimental, Joyce. Not if he's going to do his job. Your job, your railroad station, that's all that counts. Sure, I have a different point of view. Yesterday you called yourself an ordinary citizen, but you're not. You're a policeman 24 hours a day. Willie, do you take cream or lemon? Uh, uh, lemon, Mrs. Willicombe. Lots of lemon. I like things good and sour. <laughs> Joyce, too. When she was little, she liked to eat lemon. 
I think she still does. I'm sorry, Bill. It's just that I'm so scared that Lona... <sighs> Come on. Let's be friends and have some tea. And while I sat there drinking tea, Beacon, his girlfriend, and Lorna Murchison were on their way to another hideout. The alarm for Beacon's car had been canceled, but some of the patrolmen walking their beats hadn't gotten the word, and one of them spotted it. For. Drugstore. I want to make a couple of phone calls. I got to find out where that Marley is. Keep the kid in the floor and put the blanket over. I'll be back in a few minutes. Mm-hmm. Is this your automobile, lady? It's, uh, it's my friend's. What's the matter? Can't we park? Just or... stay where you are, miss. What's that on the floor, under the blanket? Oh, it's nothing. Nothing at all. Get out of the car, lady. Sorry, but I've got to take a look. Hello? Oh, yes, yes, he is. Just a moment, please. A man wants to speak to Lieutenant Calhoun. Oh, oh, thanks. You see, they don't all call me Willie, Mrs. Willicombe. Uh-huh. Hello? Donnelly. I'm at City Hospital. Hospital? Beacom's girlfriend. She's been shot. She won't last long, Calhoun. Better get over here. Oh, uh, who shot her? I'll give you all of it when you get here. I'm on my way. Bill. Not... Not long. No, no. Uh, Beacom's girlfriend. I'll call you later. When I got to the hospital, Donnelly told me. Patrolman had found Lorna. But just then, Beacom walked out of the drugstore. Marge yelled to him, and Beacom started shooting. One of the bullets hit Marge, and the others killed the patrolman. Beacom left them both on the sidewalk and drove away. The girl's unconscious now. Doctors say she hasn't got a chance. But when you questioned her... She what... said that Beacom was going to kill the Murchison girl, but not until after he got the money. Now, where where would he have taken her? That's what I was asking her when she blanked out. Inspector. Well? That's all we'll get out of her. She's dead. Maybe she wasn't telling the truth. Yeah, she knew she was dying, Mr. Murchison. No... I don't think she'd lie. What do you want me to do? Give up hope entirely? Oh, let me drive you home, and after you've had some rest, Thanks, maybe you... Thanks, but I'd rather go alone. I'll be at the station at noon tomorrow. Maybe it's only one chance in a million, but I'll be there with the money and my prayers. Prayers? You know, Calhoun, when I first started as a cop, I never believed much in praying. I found a nightstick was a lot more reliable... Well, a man gets older. Tell me something, Inspector. Do you ever get criticized for doing your job? (laughs) By everybody. From my wife down to the commissioner himself. (laughs) Somebody uh, been belaboring you? I'm a cop 24 hours a day. All I care about is my railroad station. Well, a good cop ought to be working full time, but uh, a man has to be careful he doesn't become all cop. Yeah. Tell me, that, uh, that patrolman who was killed, he have a family? Four kids. I should never have tackled a setup like that alone. A guy doesn't jump into fire feet first. Sometimes a man has to jump. Feet first or head first. A foolish man. You were in the war, Calhoun. Were you ever pinned down by mortar fire? There was always someone, some foolish man, who'd stand up and walk right into it. That's how wars are won. And that's how fellows wind up on slabs before their time. Donnelly, what's going to happen tomorrow? Uh, Beacom will collect a hundred thousand dollars. Let's see. There were four of them at the start. Beacom, Hatter, Marley, and the girl. He's the only one left. He's got to make that collection alone now. Maybe so. He'll have to show himself when he picks the money up from the messenger. He must have his hands full with that poor blind kid. Why? Why should he? There's a thousand places to unload a body. I still don't believe it. He wouldn't risk our finding a body before he has a crack at the money. And he knows now that we know all about him. His girl said he planned to kill her as soon as he got the money, but he made that plan before he knew we had a line on him. The man's a criminal. He'll do things the criminal way. I'm going home and get some sleep. I'll see you at Union Station in the morning. As we had stood there in the hospital talking... 
Across the city at the freight yards, a car was coming to a stop. This was late Saturday night. The place was deserted. Underneath the huge warehouses is the municipal freight tunnel. A man got out of the car leading a blind girl. He had once worked here. He knew just where he was. A few moments later, they were on the freight elevator going down into the tunnel. We pause now for station identification. Curtain rises on Act Three of Union Station, starring William Holden as Bill Calhoun, Nancy Olson as Joyce, and Lyle Betker as Beacon. Joyce met me the next morning. We had breakfast in the station restaurant. I just spoke to Mr. Murchison. He went to the bank. The FBI men arranged it for him. Yes, I know. He should be here in about a half an hour. Bill, I... I think he believes that... that Lorna's... Oh, he wants you to take your position in the main concourse at 11 o'clock. Everybody will be ready by then. Please tell me. Do you honestly think that Lorna's all right? Oh, I don't know the answers. Nobody does. Then it's all over. Well, you don't know that. Even you know. I'll tell you one thing. If Lorna's all right now, she's going to stay that way. Nobody's going to get a chance to hurt her. Thanks, but you don't have to pretend for me. I know it's too late. Inspector Donnelly knows it, too. Oh, he does, does he? Well, who does Donnelly think he is to give up for Willie Calhoun? <clears throat> uh, more coffee? No. No, thanks. Uh, come on, then. Let's get up to the office. <laughs> The next few hours held all the answers. Meanwhile, once again, the waiting. The long, endless waiting. Someone else was waiting, too. Just a mile away from us. Lorna Murchison. <laughs> Come on, stop your ball on cookie. I got something to tell you. Now, pretty soon now, I'm going to be leaving you. Where are we? What is this place? So cold and damp. Kept you guessing for quite a while, didn't I? <laughs> you ever hear the municipal tunnel? It's kind of a busy place. Every day except Sunday. And it's a lonely place, not a sound. Except maybe some water dripping and the crackle of electricity. Oh, yeah. It's all electric down here. High tension to run the switching engines. Real dangerous unless you can see your way around. Oh, please tell me. Please. Are we really going to meet my father? I used to sneak down here when I was a kid. Rob the freight cars. Once I got a dozen pairs of shoes. You know something? Not one of them fit me. Uh, didn't think I'd ever graduate into the hundred grand class. You're not taking me to my father. You were lying to me. Scream your head off, Cookie. It's Sunday and you're 40 feet underground. Go on and scream. For two days now, I've had to listen to you yapping about wanting to die. Well, here's your chance. When I go, there'll be no one around, nothing. Nothing but you and a flock of high-tension wires. They got signs painted on the walls. Danger, high voltage. Don't say I didn't warn you. Now get out of your coat. No. I said get out of your coat. That's it. Coat goes into this suitcase, Cookie. Needs a little weight. There. Now it's exactly like the suitcase your old man's gonna bring me. Boy, that place is going to be full of cops, all looking for me. 30, 40, 50 cops. And I'm going to make them all look like suckers. Oh, you'll get your money. Please, please don't leave me here. Nothing wrong with your feet, is there? You want to get out? Okay, start walking. You'll cry so fast it'll curl your hair. So long, Cookie. I'll find you tomorrow, if you're still around. 20 minutes later... The clerk on duty in one of the parcel rooms of the Union Station heard a door close behind him. He turned around. Facing him was a man wearing the jacket and cap of a railroad brakeman. Hey, just a minute. You got no right in here. You... 
<laughs> okay, friend, now you know the score. Next time I use the gun. Well, what do you want? Keep your mouth shut, stay clear of your window, and do exactly what I tell you. Now sit down. How do I get an outside line on the, this phone? Uh, nine. You dial nine. Operator, Western Union, please. This is River 2, 4599. You're shaking, friend. It's okay. You're doing fine. I'll be out of your hair in a little... Hello, Western Union? I want a messenger. Yeah, I want a messenger to pick up a suitcase. Union Station. The information booth in the main concourse. You got that? The information booth in the main concourse. Now, he's to take the suitcase to the east entrance parcel room. He's to go aboard the Pioneer Limited. Yeah, okay. Now, suppose you repeat all that. At 12 o'clock, Murchison stood in front of the information booth. On the counter, in the suitcase, was $100,000. At two minutes after 12, a Western Union messenger walked up. Is this the suitcase I'm supposed to pick up? Yes. Wait a minute. Do you have a message for me? Nobody said anything about a message, mister. Very well, then. Take the suitcase. From every part of the station, men stood watching the messenger. We saw him carry the suitcase to the east entrance parcel room. But then something happened that held us back. They told me to bring the suitcase here. It's to go on the Pioneer Limited. Well, I, I don't care what they told you. Give them back the suitcase, friend. Uh, yes, uh, take this suitcase back. Uh, we don't handle baggage here, not for, the, not for the Pioneer Limited. Well, this is the parcel room, isn't it? You're to take the bag to the other parcel room, the one directly across the station. Okay, okay, give it here, then. Bill, Bill, look, he still has the suitcase. He's taking it somewhere else. It's all right, he's being followed. But why would he... That's not the same suitcase. That piece of cloth sticking out, it's a coat. Why, that's Lorna's coat. Stay here with Mr. Murchison. Cage, friend. Where's the messenger now? Uh, he's uh, he's walking to the other parcel room. He's about halfway there. Anyone following him? I said anyone uh, following him? Uh, I'm not sure. I I can't tell. You know, I'm kind of proud of myself. Switching bags like that. Anyone coming this way? Yes. Who? Uh, it's man. You just keep in front of that window. I'm right next to your friend, and this gun's loaded. Hey, you parcel room. What's with that messenger? Uh, he, uh, he wanted to check through for a train, Lieutenant. We, we don't handle train baggage on this side. He's here, isn't he? He's in there with you now. Honest, Lieutenant, there's nobody here. Drop to the floor. Come and get me, sucker. Where is he? Where'd he go? I don't know. Somebody just came through here. He slugged me. I don't know where he went. Is there any other way out of this power plant? Wait, wait, wait a minute. There's an air shaft in the back of the transformer. It goes through the city tunnel. Where? To the right, Lieutenant, behind the transformer. Now, look. Call my office. Get Inspector Donnelly. Tell him that Beacom's been wounded. That he's somewhere in the tunnel. He's got a gun, Lieutenant. Wait for help. It was dark in the tunnel. Just an occasional light glowing in the distance. And the cold gleam of the tracks. Far off, I could hear Beacom running. Then the footsteps stopped. I started after them. Beacom! Beacom, listen to me! Help! Oh, please! Please help me! Lorna! Stay where you are! Don't move! Those shots were for me. The girl was still somewhere in back of him. I made my way to the wall of the tunnel and clung to it. On the wall, a few feet ahead, was an intercom phone. I pressed the buzzer. Watchman's office. Look, I'm Lieutenant Calhoun, Railroad Police. Get me through to my office. Yes, sir. Beacom, can you hear me? I'm listening. You're hurt, Beacom. I didn't miss up there in the parcel office. Throw your gun away and come towards me with your hands up. If you think I'm hurt, just start walking this way. The police will find us. They'll cover every exit and every entrance. <laughs> Expect me to fall for that? It's the percentages, Beacom. You always have a better chance if you walk out. Calhoun, where are you? This is Donnelly Calhoun. Just hang on and listen. I'll walk down, all right? Me and Warner. You gotta pass me to get to her. Beacom's got the girl in the tunnel. I think she's all right. 
Now come in from the Rutgers Street entrance, but be careful with your shooting. That's just to let you know I'm still in business, Calhoun. I'm going to pick up Cookie. Don't make me kill her. What good would it do to hurt her? She's my ticket out of here. If anybody tries to stop me, I'll kill her. Calhoun, are you still there? Go ahead. We're moving in. Can you hold him there? I'll try. Black out everything, Donnelly. The lights, power, everything. Where are you? Oh, please, find me, please. I can't see. She's getting nervous, waiting for me. Hey, the lights! Why are you scared? Run, Lorna. Away from my voice. Keep running. You stay just where I left your cookie. The power lines are off, Lorna. They won't hurt now. You start running, cookie, and I start shooting. I'm coming after you, Beacom. You got any bullets left, you better save them for me. Calhoun. Can you hear me, Calhoun? We've blacked out the tunnel, Inspector. Anything else from Calhoun? He started after Beacom. The watchman's located them, sir. Somewhere between the station and the Rutgers Street exit. The prowl car should be there by now. Stand by this phone, Stein, just in case. Come on, Shattuck. We'll go down through that air shaft. <laughs> it's all right, Lorna. It's all right now. Where is he? Uh, he's here, Lorna, but he'll never harm anyone again. He shot you, didn't he? You're hurt. Uh, little nothing to worry about. You hear them? That's the police. Calhoun! Over here. You can use your lights. Beacom's dead. The girl's with me. She's all right. Beacom's over there near the switch. Come on, Donnelly. Get us out of here. All right, easy now. Just get him to that elevator. Well, this is where he broke in, Calhoun. Same elevator he used to take her down there. Yeah. Where's Lorna now? Oh, she's with her father. Over there at the ambulance. Outside of shock, she's going to be okay. Bill! What are you doing here? Never mind what I'm doing here. And what do you, where do you think you're going? I want to go and get cleaned up. You sit down on that crate. Go on, sit down. Yeah, she's right, Bill. Yeah, what about that shoulder? Oh, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Well, what about the money, Calhoun? Do you have it on him? It's in the tunnel. A couple hundred feet up the track. Well, just don't stand there, Inspector. Get the doctor. He's in the ambulance. Yes, ma'am. Oh, stop making a fuss. Tough Willie. And don't call me Willie. Now, hold still. I've got to get your coat off. I suppose it's a tough reputation you have. Tough Willie. Afraid to holler, ouch. Ouch! Uh, now, look, please. When anyone's around, don't call me Willie, will you? Uh, can I make a suggestion? Well, grab her, Willie, while you can. <laughs> uh, head first or feet first. There's always some foolish man who walks right into it. In a minute, our stars will return. Most everyone knows that education is divided into two parts. Part one, we might say, consists of book study. And part two consists of putting the knowledge gained from books into operation. Part two in our schools and colleges is usually referred to as lab work. For example, the young student doctor reads and memorizes the workings of the human body, then moves on to become a hospital intern to put that knowledge into action. The botanist reads about a certain type leaf or plant formation, then lays down his textbook and turns to his microscope, where he studies a specimen of this particular plant life. You know, in a certain sense... You men in the armed forces overseas are being studied under a microscope. And on the top side of that microscope are millions of people who have heard a lot or read a lot about Americans. Now, perhaps for the first time in their lives, they have an opportunity to do some lab work. So let them see a good specimen, a true specimen, a true picture of the United States. Remember, a country is known by its people. What people think about your country depends on you. Now, here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. And here they are at the footlights for their curtain call. William Holden, Nancy Olson, and Lyle Betcher. <laughs> well, Bill, what's doing over on the Paramount lot? Willie, what's doing over on the Paramount lot? Well, uh, we're pretty busy making pictures, Bill. I just finished another exciting crime story called The Turning Point. 
Imagine Bill having the nerve to make a picture without me. <laughs> well, you have made some fine pictures together. And uh, just what was the turning point in your career, Lyle? So far, there's been none, Bill. I just go right on playing dyed-in-the-wool villains. Like your new picture, The Greatest Show on Earth? Well, Cecil B. DeMille did give me the greatest break of my career by casting me in the picture, but I'm still the villain. And what a villain. So stick around, Lyle. I, I know Paramount will come up with a turning point for you. I think we've arrived at one right here. What's the show for next week, Bill? Well, Nancy, when spring arrives, romance can't be far behind. And so next week, we have an enchanting love story, Royal Wedding. And starring in one of MGM's most successful musicals, singing and acting her original role, will be delightful Jane Powell. And as co-star, one of the most popular actors in Hollywood, George Murphy. Oh, that's going to be a wonderful show, Bill. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> The Hollywood Radio Theater is produced by Mr. William Keeley. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is John Milton Kennedy inviting you to join us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Hollywood Radio Theater is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service.